Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, if you are visiting with us, we are working through a series uh, through the book of Revelation. And so we ha- have looked at the first eight verses so far. And so this morning we're going to start at verse 9. And uh, I made the, the statement last week we would finish chapter 1, and that didn't happen, so I'm not going to make that statement again. Uh, but we will make our way as far as we can uh, through chapter 1 this morning, starting with verse 9. If you found your way there, Revelation chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 9, we'll read down to the end of the chapter. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, Write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and I Having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. And his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last, and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things." As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw on my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. You can be seated this morning. Last week, as we began looking at verses 4 through 8, we described here or saw here this prayer that John prayed for these churches that he's writing to, seven churches uh, there in uh, Asia Minor, or the modern-day Turkey. Uh, he's writing to these churches, these instructions that are being given to him by uh, Jesus himself. And he opens there with something that I want us just to remind ourselves of, because the theme of this carries through the remainder of this chapter. Uh, he describes Jesus there as the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And you remember that faithful witness is those who have bore witness and testimony, Jesus came and lived his life out as an example for those who would come after him, Uh, standing against those who would fight against the glory of the gospel, standing against those who would attempt uh, to to corrupt the true teachings of God and and living his life fully, even unto death, as a testimony uh, for the truth that God had commanded. The firstborn of the dead signifies the resurrection of Jesus, the fact that he was and only is the one who was able to defeat death by his own power. He was the first one to die and to resurrect, not by the power of someone else, but by his own power. And then the emphasis there, the ruler of the kings of the earth, because Jesus is ruling and reigning. And this is specifically important for those to whom John was writing as they suffered under the, 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 uh, the tyrants of Rome and the Roman authorities who thought that they were the greatest rulers and leaders in in the entire world, that they were gods themselves. And so John is pointing out to those believers, remember, we serve the one who is the ruler of the kings of this earth. No matter how great they may be, no matter how much power they have accumulated unto themselves, there sits one who is higher and more glorious and more powerful than even Caesar himself, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In verse 9, John moves from this prayer that he is praying for the church to strengthen them. He's praying for the church to prepare them for what's about to happen. You remember just a few short years after John writes this letter, after he sees this vision, writes these letters to the churches, and writes down the remainder of the vision found here in the book of Revelation, uh, the Romans are going to come in and to destroy the city of Jerusalem. Uh, They're going to move in and tear down everything, as Jesus described in Matthew 24, not one stone left on top of the other. So as we see, 
all the way through the scriptures. We saw this in the book of Daniel. We see it now here in the book of Revelation. God prepares his people for tribulation. God prepares them ahead of time to encourage them and to strengthen them so that in the midst of tribulation, they don't feel overwhelmed. And brothers and sisters, the same applies to us today. We have this book in order that we prepare ourselves for tribulation from the encouragement that comes from God's word. So God is doing this work here. And so John has prayed for them to strengthen them. God has prayed, John has prayed for them to strengthen them in the, in, in the goodness of who God is to remind them of the glory of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And now in verse 9, John moves to a, a description of a partnership that exists. Notice what he says there in verse 9. He says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you recall from our introduction to this book, John is in exile on the island of Patmos, which is about 37 miles southwest of modern-day Turkey. John is there uh, because of his commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's there because of his bold teaching and his unwillingness to recant the things that he taught. He was not willing to stop. He was not willing to tone it down. He was not willing to turn back. And because of that, he now found himself in exile. I want you to notice there that John does not say that he is in prison there because of, of his word. He said it's because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. We, we've talked about this before, that when it comes to being a Christian, we will be hated in this world, but we should be hated because of the word of Jesus, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, not because we're jerks. John here was not in prison because he was a jerk to people. He was in prison because he just stood up for the truth of the gospel. And that was enough for the world to hate him. So he's there and he's, he's suffering here in prison. But I want you to notice here, as we see this in the gospel writers and in, in, the, in the disciples, that their heart and passion is not so much concerned about the position that they find themselves in, but in the fellowship of the saints that, that, that even goes beyond physical ability to be with one another. We oftentimes think of fellowship as being together, as being together in a room. But what we find is in, in the realm of Christianity, brothers and sisters, we're in fellowship here because we're all here together. But we're also in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ across the globe, even if we're not there with them, because we're all part of the church of Jesus Christ. This, this is not just the only church. God's church exists across the world, across the globe, and we are all in fellowship together. And notice what John says here. He says he's a fellow, par fellow partaker in the tribulation and the kingdom and the perseverance. Now, that tribulation that G John describes here is the same tribulation that Jesus described in Matthew chapter 24. You remember that phrase? He said, for then there will be a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. And again, Jesus there in Matthew 24 is describing that time period when the Romans would begin to come in and to destroy Jerusalem and more importantly, destroy the temple that existed there in Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus was coming in spiritual judgment over the nation of Israel and over the city of Jerusalem to signify the fact that God had brought an end to the Jewish era. God had used it mightily. It had been his plan and his purpose, but now that had come to an end. There was no longer a need for an earthly tabernacle. There was no longer a need for an earthly temple or for animal sacrifices because the final sacrifice had come. The Lamb of God had come into the world and made the final necessary atoning sacrifice for sin. So no longer was there a need for any of that. And because the Jewish people refused to put their trust in the Messiah, because they refused to turn, their, turn away from that and to turn to what God had instituted through Jesus, ultimately God came in destruction and judgment upon Jerusalem. And Jesus is pointing this out in Matthew 24, and John is highlighting it here that this great tribulation is about to come over Jerusalem. And it would not just be the Jews who encountered this, also the Christians who are living there are going to witness these things and watch these things take place as the Romans come in and to destroy the city. He also describes here not just the tribulation that he is a partner in them with, but he also says the kingdom. 
And the kingdom is that of Jesus Christ. It's a kingdom of which they were already a part of and in which they already knew the great power of it through Jesus. As Jesus had ascended back into heaven, the scripture tells us that he took his position of authority at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And from there, from that moment, Jesus is ruling and reigning over all kingdoms, all powers and principalities and authorities. Jesus is the one who's sitting there on the throne, ruling and reigning, even at this day. We find it there in the Great Commission. What did Jesus say? All power and authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So nothing, no power, no king, no ruler is higher or greater than the authority and the power that Jesus Christ himself has. And he commissioned his disciples to go out in that authority and in that power. So Jesus has has, has risen to heaven. He has this power and authority, and John describes this here. On one hand, he says we are partakers, we're partners in the tribulation, and he also says that we are partners in the kingdom. Now, you might think that sounds a little confusing, right? How, how could you be partakers in the tribulation, partners in, in, in difficulty, and also being a part of the kingdom, which is Jesus' full power and reign and authority? But because nowhere in the Bible does it tell us that the Christian life, even in the power of Christ's kingdom, is going to be free from difficulty or tribulation. In fact, it says just the opposite. It says in Acts chapter 14, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Amen. One commentator said it this way. He said, quote, St. John wanted his readers to understand that they were both in, they were in both the great tribulation and the kingdom, and in fact, they were in that tribulation precisely because the kingdom had come. They were in a war fighting for the kingdom's victory, and thus they needed the third element in St. John's worldview, perseverance in Christ Jesus, end quote. John is pointing out that the reason that the church and the reason that this tribulation was about to come was precisely because God had put Jesus in power and authority. And because Jesus is ruling and reigning, this tribulation comes as, as Satan does everything he can to fight against God's plan and purpose. And as partakers in the kingdom of God, they're going to suffer through difficulty and tribulation. That's why John lists that third thing there. He says not just partakers in the tribulation and kingdom, but he also says in perseverance. That perseverance is the idea of patience. Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance, patience, perseverance, the race that is set before us. In the Christian life, we have the tendency to become impatient. We see things happening around us. We want to see God doing things quicker or faster or more according to our timetable. But we have to trust and run with patience. It's a long race. It's an arduous race. Sometimes it's easier and sometimes it's more difficult. But the encouragement that comes from all of this, notice what John says here. In the tribulation, in the power of Christ's kingdom, in the necessary of patience or perseverance, notice what he says there in the next words. He says, which are in Jesus. Because in order to do any of this, in order to endure the tribulations of this life, and specifically for these people in order to endure the tribulation that was about to fall upon them, which again, remember Jesus says, has not happened since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. This is how grandiose this tribulation was. In order for us to live in trusting in the power of Christ's kingdom, in order for us to have the patience that is necessary, we must understand that all of this is through Jesus himself. That passage in Hebrews that I just read 
finishes in the next verse by saying it this way, enduring the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. How do we run this race with patience? How do we run this race with endurance? By setting our eyes on Jesus. In the midst of difficulty, brothers and sisters, it is often our habit to set our eyes in every other place but on Jesus. We set our eyes on fixing the problem ourselves. We set our eyes on why somebody else is the cause of our problems. We set our eyes on seeking advice from worldly counsel instead of just fixing our eyes upon Him. John is calling these believers to understand that in the midst of everything of the Christian life, the highs, the lows, and the longevity, that all of it is in Jesus Christ. And that's where we have to continually set our focus continually guide our mind back to, continually set our heart towards those things. We know that John was no flowery, feel-good preacher. He was a man who was filled with passion and boldness for the truth of Christ and the gospel. And this boldness that John had when we read through the Scriptures came from his understanding of Christ's victory and power over all the things in this life. Why does John emphasize here the kingdom and that perseverance? Because how else could he encourage the church and these Christians to stand up against Rome unless he truly believed and knew that Jesus was more powerful than the Roman Empire? It would be foolish for John to encourage these Christians to resolve themselves to be patient in the midst of tribulation and to trust in the power of Christ's kingdom if Jesus' kingdom wasn't really powerful in the Roman Empire. But he knew that it was. And he's reminding them of this fact, because of Jesus' power and authority, you have nothing to fear. Is it going to be hard? Yes. Is it going to be difficult? Yes. But in the end, Jesus has the victory secured. I'm sure every great general and leader of the past would love to have gone into battle knowing that ultimately the victory was theirs. But they don't. They go into a battle hoping and, and feeling like they're pretty strong. They, they have the, the greater military strength. They have the greater weaponry, maybe perhaps more soldiers than the other side does. But there's been some major upsets when it comes to warfare in the history of the world, where the smaller army had the victory over the larger army. But this isn't like that. We know the end. We know the one who has all power, authority, and victory. And no matter what Satan may throw at the kingdom of God, no matter what Satan may throw as us as believers, no matter what may happen in this life, we know that Jesus has the victory. And that's what carries us through these moments. So John is encouraging them in this partnership because he wants them to know that they're not alone. He's not there with them. He can't be there and walk through this moment with them. But he wants them to know, brothers and sisters, you are not alone. I am enduring the same thing. I'm not with you, but I'm walking through the same thing here. So not only do we see this partnership, but I want you to notice in verses 10 and 11, there is a, a pronouncement that takes place. John is given an instruction here. Something is described to him. And notice there in verse 10, it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. Now that word in the Spirit there is just describing the state of mind as John was worshiping. He tells us he's worshiping on the Lord's Day. It's the first day of the week. We know throughout the Old Testament that Jewish people celebrated uh, their worship of God on the Sabbath day, which was the seventh day of the week or Saturday. But after Jesus' resurrection, the church started to worship on Sunday, the day of the Lord's resurrection. Now that's why we see this in the Scripture referred to as the Lord's Day. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the Christian Sabbath and refers to the Jewish Sabbath. 
So John, although he's not at home, although he's far away from his other brothers and sisters in Christ, he's worshiping on Sunday. He's worshiping the Lord. And in the midst of that worship, the Lord comes and carries him away in a vision. He's in the Spirit. The Lord has come and met him in a very real way and begun to reveal to John this spiritual vision of the things which are about to happen. John is commanded to write these things down. He's commanded to write them down because he's commanded then to send them to the seven churches. These seven churches listed for us are just describing the churches again that are there in modern day Turkey. And if you follow these churches on a map, starting with Ephesus and moving all the way to Laodicea, this is really the common pathway of how these letters would have been distributed. Again, remember, this is a period of time. He didn't have a copy machine. He didn't have a printer. John would have written this letter. He would have given it to someone as his messenger. They would have taken it to the first church. It would have been read there. Then that letter would have been taken to the next church and then to the next church and so on and so forth as it made, it way, it made its way through the seven churches. And if you follow these churches on a map, the way that John has them listed here is the natural progression in order in the way that they would have been delivered. First to Ephesus, then to Smyrna, moving really northward, then east and south again, almost in a horseshoe type shape there in modern day Turkey. Now the question is, why is seven the number here? There were other churches in the region. There were other churches that had been established there. So why these? Uh, most commentators and scholars agree that it seems like the number was chosen because of the symbolic nature of the number seven in the Scripture. Now, all throughout the Scripture, the number seven testifies to the idea of perfection or completeness. And so these letters are written to specific churches there in Asia, specific churches at a specific time, and each one of them are facing specific issues that are occurring inside of this church. And so it's written to address those issues and to ensure that these churches would make the necessary corrections that God expected them to do. However, that it's number seven, that idea of completeness in reference to these churches, really also alludes to the fact that the messages that are contained to these seven churches are timeless messages that can be learned from by the church in any age. Because as we look at these encounters with these churches— as we look at the things that each one of these churches are facing, sometimes they're doing well and sometimes they're not doing well. Sometimes they are facing difficulties. And each one of these encounters are different types of things that we can also see happening in modern day churches. So there's this call and this recognition to say that even though John is writing these to very specific churches in this period of time, that God in his providence has also instituted this timeless message that can be applied that any church of any age can look at these letters and say, hey, we see these same things happening in our church. What should we do? We see this same type of influence happening here. What should we do? God is hearkening and calling the churches to respond to those things. But where did this voice come from? He says he hears this voice like the sound of a trumpet calling him to do these things. Notice in verse 12, John now sees a picture of Jesus. Verse 12, he says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, which has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in his strength. So as John hears this voice, he naturally does what all of us would do. He turns to see who is talking to me. Where's this voice coming from? And he sees like one like the son of man. Now, beginning with the setting of this vision, John says that as he sees this one like the Son of Man, that he's standing there in the middle of seven golden lampstands. Now, these seven lampstands are a hearkening back to the seven-branched lamp that would stand in the tabernacle. In the tabernacle, it was one lamp with seven branches off of it, and the priests used that lamp to provide light as they would offer their sacrifices. Here, we see one standing in the middle of seven individual lampstands. And these lampstands represent the seven churches. We'll find that out just a bit later on. Represent the seven churches that are listed earlier. 
And, and why is God using here, why is Jesus using here these lampstands to represent these individual churches? Well, remember, what is the church described as in the New Testament? The church is described as the light of the world. Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Philippians chapter 2, he says, Children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. We're encouraged to walk as children of light. So the churches here are represented as lights in the world. But we also see here a picture here of Jesus' presence and ministry inside of the churches. Because whereas in the Old Testament, in the temple, it was one lampstand with seven lamps, now we see seven individual lampstands representing, again, the churches. But Jesus is there in the middle of the lampstands. It's highlighting Christ's presence in and with the church. We find this laid out for us in Matthew chapter 18. We know that, pro that passage very well. It's describing the, the resolving of sin and discipline in the church. And there's a verse there that is oftentimes highly abused where it says, for there were two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. Now, most people use that phrase to describe a, a poorly attended prayer meeting because they feel bad because nobody showed up and they say, well, we're two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. We don't have to feel bad about it. But that's not what Jesus is describing at all. God's presence is with us wherever we go. We, we are indwelt with the power of God's presence. What Jesus is describing here is that when God's people are gathered together and they are doing the work under his authority and his power, seeking his presence, that he is there in the midst. It's as he is making that decision along with them. They are following his command and his obedience. So we can also see that that applies to everything that we do as the gathered body of Christ. When we are seeking to obey God, Jesus' presence is here with us as the church, guiding us and directing us in the things that we do. St. Germanus, who was the Archbishop of Constantinople, described it this way. As he looked at this passage, he says, The church is an earthly heaven in which the super celestial God walk, dwells and walks about. God's presence is with us as the church of Jesus Christ when we do and operate according to his prescribed methods. As John looks and sees this one like the Son of Man, he's seeing none other than the Lord and Savior Jesus himself. Amen. And you notice there, there is this glorious description that John gives here of, of how Jesus looks. And this is the only place in the Bible where we find such a description of Jesus' features. But as we read through this, we understand that John here is not describing a literal depiction of Jesus. It's a very symbolic depiction of Jesus. Because he describes the golden sash and his white hair and his head and, and glowing and the eyes like flames of fire, feet like burnished bronze, a voice like the sound of many waters. The description that John gives here is strikingly similar uh, to Daniel's description of the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus there in his book, although there are a couple of different differences. Now, each one of these things can be pointed to recognize a certain aspect of Jesus's power and authority. And the golden band is symbolic of high rank. It speaks to the idea of, of the power and the position that Jesus is in. The robe is symbolic of the priestly garment that the priest was worn. We know that Jesus is our great high priest, the white hair symbolizes age and honor, flaming eyes, a piercing vision that sees all things, knows all things. They can see anything that's happening. The feet like burnished bronze symbolize the certainty of judgment. Jesus one day is coming and he will crush those who have opposed him. The voice like the sound of many waters speaking again to the authority and the power of his voice as he speaks. The seven stars we'll talk about in just a minute. And that two-edged sword is a descriptor of his word. Just a few weeks ago, we looked at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where the word of God is described to us as living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. One commentator, as I studied this week, pointed out that it, it's easy to miss the big picture that John is trying to convey here if we spend too much time trying to dissect each description of Jesus. John here is not trying to cause us to try to dissect, okay, well, what does John mean by, by this golden sash? What does he mean by the white wool? And, and try to dig in deeply into these things. 
John is painting a big picture here, not a nuanced picture. What he's trying to describe is that Jesus here is described as the incarnate glory of God. And John here is recognizing and calling us to think back to what he witnessed when he saw the transfiguration of Jesus there in Matthew chapter 17. It says he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his garments became as white as light. John here is describing Jesus to try to do it in such a way that the church and that we would be reminded of who Jesus truly is. He's not just some man who did some good things. He was not just a wise man, but Jesus truly is the Son of God, the incarnate glory of God. That's why even throughout the book of Revelation, Jesus uses language that in the Old Testament was only used to describe God the Father. Jesus uses that language for himself to describe him because he wants them to understand the power and the glory and the splendor of who he is. And in light of such a beautiful yet awe-inspiring picture, John finds himself in need of something. Because in light of witnessing the true glory and splendor of Christ, notice what John does. Verse 17. He says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. This is the only natural response when confronted with such a visage of who Jesus truly is. To see the glory of the Son of God in full splendor is an awe-inspiring event. And his response was very similar to what Daniel's did. And remember in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel saw this pre-incarnate vision of Jesus described in such the same way. And Daniel described it this way. He said, so I was left alone and saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me for my natural color turned to a deathly pallor and retained no strength. Immediately. For both John and for Daniel, when seeing the glory of who Jesus was, they just fell down, to their, down on their face. And so what did John need in this moment? John needed to be comforted by Jesus. Daniel was comforted, and so here too is John. Look at these words. He says, and he placed his right hand on me saying, Do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Can you imagine in this moment that you see the glory of Jesus and just you just fall down? And for John, he he understands the truth of Christ. And he understands the glory of God. And no doubt, even in that moment, even knowing that that he is in Christ, even knowing that he has this relationship with Jesus, still filled with so much awe and terror that he lays there in fear. On his, And how do we know he was afraid? Well, because Jesus says, don't be afraid. He, he's laying there just wondering, what, what do I do next? And can I pause for just a moment to emphasize the fact Far too often, a modern-day Jesus does not inspire the awe and the wonder that the biblical Jesus does. When we try to dumb Jesus down to our level, we lose what John sees here. John would have not responded to the modern American Jesus in the same way as he does here to the true Jesus. So he falls down, he's laying there. And as I studied this passage, I kept coming back to this, just thinking in this moment, there's something so special about what Jesus does here. Because Jesus doesn't just tell him to get up. He comes and he puts his hand on him. Right There's there's this level of, of, of intimacy that Jesus comes and he puts his hand on him and tells him, don't just get up. He says, do not be afraid. What, what, what a glorious thing that Jesus does. Jesus could have just told him to get up. Get up, stand on your feet. 
But no, he comes to him in this comfort and he lays his hand on him and he tells him, do not be afraid. And why should not John be afraid? Because Jesus tells him, he says, I'm the first and the last. I have been, I have and always will be. He, he, he repeats some of the phraseology that's used there in verses eight. In verse eight. He re- again reminds John of his power and authority that he is God incarnate. That he's the living one. Again, there's another one of those words that Jesus uses to describe himself in an Old Testament term for God. He said, I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. He's describing again, reminding John of his resurrection power. And what does that remind John of? That reminds John that because Jesus has defeated death and because he has resurrection power, John also has that resurrection power in his life. And he says, I have the keys of death and hell. One of the most powerful moments of people's lives in understanding in the way that life works is is death. Why? Because death is something that people can't do anything about. You can try to postpone your death by eating a healthy diet, taking lots of medication. You can try to postpone the effects of how your life transforms by having surgery and making you look less old than you actually are. Scientists are always working at ways to promote immortality, right? If we can do this or do that, so we can increase the lifespan of people. But ultimately, you can't do anything about death. It comes for you. And it comes when God has ordained it for you. It's the one thing of all the things in this life that people cannot control themselves. And so it's a thing of fear for many people in this world. Death is the one thing that haunts them both day and night because despite how rich they are, how successful they are, how powerful they are, they can't control death. But Jesus says he has the keys of death and of hell. There is nothing, beloved, in this life, nothing in this life that Jesus is not ruler and Lord over. And what an encouragement that is to us as believers to know that we, again, have nothing to fear in this life because Jesus is over it all. As Jesus brings this encouragement to John, as he lifts him back off of his feet and tells him not to be afraid, I want you to notice here finally in verses 19 and 20, this proclamation that Jesus makes. He says, Therefore write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. John again is commanded to write these things down and he's commanded to write it in three ways. He says, the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. There are Differing interpretations of this phrase, depending upon your your eschatology viewpoint. But the logical seems to be that John is to describe, to write down the things which he has seen first, which is the vision right now. He's writing down the things which he has seen, which is the vision that will will encompass the majority of the book of Revelation. The things that are, which are present tense, because we know the things of the vision are the things which are yet to come. And he says, the letters, the things which are, are the seven churches and the things which will soon take place after these things is the bulk of the remainder of the book ultimately will be fulfilled there in the destruction of Jerusalem in in AD, in 70 AD. So he's, he's, he's really kind of given a threefold thing here. Write down the description of this vision, write down the letters to the seven churches, and then write down ultimately the things which will take place after all of this. Now then Jesus reveals to John the mystery here because earlier Jesus had been there amongst the seven stars in his right hand and the seven golden lampstands. And so no doubt John is questioning what this means. And so Jesus reveals this to him. He says the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So seven stars, which represent seven angels. And these seven angels belong to the seven churches. But now what does this mean? What is, what is Jesus describing here? What is he picturing here? Now this is again a more debated topic, but most commentators fall on the line here that Jesus is referring here as the angels of the seven churches, as the pastors 
of those seven churches. And there's a couple of reasons for this interpretation. Now, the word angel is oftentimes used in the Old Testament as the word messenger. It oftentimes refers to the prophets who were tasked with delivering the message or the word of God to his people. In our modern vernacular, we use the word angel to describe one thing, some type of heavenly being. But in the Bible, it's used concurrently with the word messenger. So it can also mean messenger. Now, the angel of each of these churches is addressed in the opening letters of to each of these churches. If you look there at verse 1 of chapter 2, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write. And it was then the job of the one who the letter was written to, to deliver that message to the church. So it seems logical that if the angel is intended to deliver the message, it seems again most logical that the letter is being delivered to the pastor of that church, and that in 10 they would then read it to the congregation and deliver that message from God to those churches. As I noted in our last time together, this book is less about the end of the world and more about the glory and the power of Christ in his kingdom. And we see this here. We we see John here, just in this opening chapter, describing there in verses 4 through 8, the glory of the triune God, uh, of who the triune God is, and God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then here, as this vision begins to open up, John describes Jesus in this incarnate glory, describing Jesus in such a way that would probably shock most people in the world today, because they picture Jesus as this very meek and mild person who would never say anything harsh to anybody. Jesus is your best buddy. You can go fishing together. You can hang out together. And Jesus was one who came very meek and mild in the first time. He came to what? to serve and not to be served. Jesus came in such a way that he was not recognized by the Jewish people as the Messiah because he did not come in like a lion. He was a lamb. But the scripture is very clear that when Jesus comes back again, he's coming as a ruling and conquering king. He's coming in the fullness of his glory. And more people today would do well to understand that the Jesus there in the gospels was the one who came to prepare a way and to make a way for people to come. But the Jesus who's coming back, if you don't have a relationship with him, he's coming back in the fullness of his glory and power and judgment. And helping people to understand the truth of what it means for Jesus now to be seated in that position and power of authority. And as we move through the next several months in this book, we're going to see the fullness of the power of Christ's kingdom. Because that's what's being revealed here in the book of Revelation. As God brings judgment on Jerusalem. He is revealing the power of Christ's kingdom and his authority because he's bringing an end to this Jewish age and catapulting forward the new glorious age of the church. We should be encouraged as we read this book because it is such a beautiful description of the power of Christ's kingdom, his authority, and his forever reign on the throne. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the truth of your word. And Lord, in my own heart, I know that I have been continually encouraged as I've studied through these passages, Lord, just to be reminded of the power and the authority that you have given to Jesus. And that understanding his rule and his reign in this world, what that means to us, as the church, and what that means to us as individual Christians. Lord, we we are not a defeated people. We are a victorious people. And Lord, your gospel is not a gospel that it will, will shrink, but your gospel is a gospel that grows in power. It is a gospel that changes people's lives. It is a message that transforms individuals and transforms cultures. We are often tempted in, Father, we are often tempted to allow our viewpoint of the success of the gospel and the success of your kingdom to be determined by what we see on the news. And Lord, forgive us for that. Forgive us that we allow the 24-hour news cycle to cause us to think that your kingdom is shrinking in power and authority. 
And that because this person or that person or this leader or that leader does something, that that means that your kingdom is losing its power or that it's not as powerful as it once was. Lord, remind us that you have seated Jesus in a position of all power and authority. And as John describes here, that he he is the ruler of all the kings of the earth. And that no matter what may happen in the short term, that the gospel is conquering and victorious in the long term. Help us, Lord, to have a long-term view of the kingdom of God and not be distracted by the short term. We thank you for the glory of Christ that was revealed to us in this passage this morning. And Lord, help us, Lord, to remember that. Help us to remember the glory of who Jesus is and to be awestruck that he was willing to come and to take upon human flesh that he was willing to be obedient to you, to go to the cross and to lay down his own life, that we could be reconciled back to you. Lord, may we be in awe that the one who John describes here is our brother. We thank you for all that you've done. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.